Shall, shall I start now, Rianne? Sure, yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the GG Plot 2 workshop, and thank you for joining us today. We hope you'll find this workshop useful. Um, please, free, please, please feel free to ask questions using the chat box. Um, our workshop facilitator um, will answer the questions uh, between during the presentation. So Rianne will try and answer your questions as she goes along. Um, please keep your microphones muted at all time. If we need to unmute you, we'll do that ourselves at this end. Um, so I'll go hand over to Rianne now to continue. Super. Thanks, Sharon. Hi, everyone. Um, hope you're having a nice afternoon. Thanks for joining me today. Um, yeah, so like Sharon says, um, I, I think the best way for a workshop to go is um, I like getting lots of questions. I like going off on tangents and, and talking about all sorts of things. So please do free, feel free to use the Zoom, the Zoom chat throughout, um, throughout the workshop. Um, if you've got any questions, put them in. Uh, if you want me to repeat anything or you didn't quite understand something, please do feel free to just pop something in the chat. And if you've got a slightly more complicated question, um, I might ask you to just unmute so we can talk about it like, like real people. Um, talking of real people, I am missing everyone's faces this year. If you are able to put your camera on, it's really nice just because I feel like I'm talking to um, real people. Um, so if you're able to put your camera on for a little bit, that would be lovely. If you don't feel comfortable doing that working at home, don't worry about that. But um, I can see Anastasia. Yeah, it's just nice to actually um, see each other and, and say hello as well. And obviously knock it on and off throughout as you will. I can see a couple of people on. So yep, nice to actually actually chat to you all today. Yep. Hello. Oh, it's lovely to see your faces. Much more normal. Um, so, yeah, please do drop us a message in the chat. Um, this workshop is is quite a beginner um, workshop. So if you've not really used R before, that's fine. Um, I'm assuming that you've used a little bit of R. But if you haven't used it at all, um, I can help get you up to speed in terms of plotting today. Um, my plan is to do about an hour or so and a bit of a practical to so get you having a go at stuff and then we'll take a break and then we'll have a kind of second half and then have another practical. So that's kind of how I'm imagining things will go. Completely depends on timing and how you all are getting on. Um, so um, I'll just share my screen uh, and then uh, we can we can get chatting. So yeah, we're going to be talking about ggplot today. Um, hopefully you've managed to get into the R Studio um, cloud. Um, you can use that for the practicals. Um, but also all of the material is also available at this link as well, um, which I'll paste in the chat. Oh, yeah. Ah, Sharon's already on it. Fantastic. Yeah. So all of the material is already online. <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, Mike B's lighting is fantastic, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so yeah, me, sorry, I haven't really introduced myself. Um, so my name is Rianne. Um, I'm a data scientist and a statistician at Jumping Rivers. And what we do at Jumping Rivers is we spend half of our time kind of teaching people how to use R. So I run a lot of training courses like this, doing everything from what is R to um, using Python to do machine learning or creating markdown reports in R or creating a, an R package. So um, I spend a lot of my time teaching and the other half of my time I actually spend as a sort of data science consultant. So we work with um, public health groups, um, but we also work with official statistics banks, pharmaceuticals, across lots of different industries. Uh, we do a lot of work in the energy sector, basically helping people use, um, use R to manipulate their data. Um, so uh, I've been programming in R for um, about 12 years now um, and really love the language and particularly love how supportive the community is. And that's something that um, I think we've seen with the NHSR community as well. So yep, yeah, um, I'm Rianne and yep, yeah, this is the company I work for. We're based up in, in the northeast in, in Newcastle, um, but I live over in Lancaster in the northwest where it's currently raining. You'll be pleased to know. And these are some of the many companies that we've done uh, training with and also sort of consultancy and, and client work with. Okay, so um, We'll just start talking about ggplot, I guess. Um, first of all, in the chat, could you just let me know, has anyone actually used ggplot before at all, or is this all new? So I just want to see a little bit in the chat, 
just either like sort of yes I've used yes you've used it a little tiny 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 amount Matt, <laughs> Mike's really setting the bar low used it badly great Paul <laughs> okay a bit slowly a little and if you've not used it at all that's totally fine too tiny amount okay we're all playing down our skills here <laughs> that's fine we, we're starting from 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 the bottom so hopefully we can all get up to speed that sounds fantastic sounds like we're all in the right room okay so there's lots and lots and lots of different ways to make graphs in R. Um, if you start googling how to make graphics in R, you'll you'll find lots of different R packages and fantastic plots um, the, the the tool that we're going to use today um, is a package an, an R package called ggplot2 started in 2005 and it, it follows what we call the grammar of graphics which is a fancy way for just saying that someone sort of thought about how we should um, create graphics in in programming and how we can kind of combine different elements of plots together um, so the way that we use or create plots in ggplot is we actually think about just building up a plot in layers so it's not about making the plot in one big command we sort of start off and go, well, what do we want to plot? And then we might decide, OK, well, what do we want on the X axis? What do we want on the Y axis? And then we think, well, what sort of things do we want to put on our plot? So do we want points um, or do we want lines? And this is what we do with 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 ggplot. We've had a great question from Zahid in the chat who says, what's the difference between ggplot and ggplot2? Yeah, this is a big one. So ggplot two is the name of an R package um, and effectively um, it was a second iteration um, so ggplot2 is the name of the R package that is used for plotting um, people sometimes say ggplot um, but effectively the name of the R package is ggplot2 the slightly confusing things I had which we'll get to a little bit later on is that when you first start using um, the package ggplot2 there's actually a function inside the ggplot2 package just called ggplot okay so there is actually a function called ggplot that does the plotting but the actual package the library the the big box of code that you download from cran is called ggplot2 does that answer your question as i fantastic so um, just to give you a feel of kind of what ggplots look like, I'll just show you. Um, we've got here um, some data on, um, on Christmas trees. Now, these uh, Christmas trees, uh, this is actually data related to people buying real trees and, and fake trees. And the data is not too important here. What I want to show you is how um, with ggplot, the plot is kind of built up in stages or layers. So if I was going to create a plot showing um, fake trees and real trees and how those numbers of sales have declined or changed over time, I might want to create a scatter plot. Uh, now you can ignore the code on the left for a second. What I want you to get a feel of is how we sort of build things up in, in layers with ggplot. So the first thing I would do is I would just create a blank plot. And then I might define my x-axis, which would be perhaps the time, right? So we're looking at sales of, of, of Christmas trees over time. And then I might add the y-axis, so how many trees are actually being sold. And then we can start to add our points. And maybe we want to color our points so we can tell the real trees from the fake trees. So in this example, the real trees are red and the blue trees are the fake trees. And then we might want to fit a line of best fit. And then we might want to actually change those colors to something a little bit more appropriate for Christmas trees. And then we might want to change our Y axis. We might want to change our X axis and we might want to add a title or a subtitle. So you can see that when we actually create a, a, a ggplot, it's not a case of having to panic and going, right, how do I make my plot? You can do it step by step by step in order to um, build up the sort of plot you want to create. And we're going to work through something like this today. In terms of why you should use ggplot, 
Um, it's super, super popular and it's really good for making high quality production ready graphics. So um, I've been looking at a lot of ggplots recently um, because John Byrne Murdoch, who I believe is speaking at the conference next week, uh, he's a data journalist for the Financial Times. He's been putting out a lot of plots related to um, coronavirus and all of these plots that he's been producing have been in, in created in, in ggplot and with R. Um, so you can see Financial Times using um, R and ggplot2 to um, create very nice sort of production ready uh, professional looking graphics. Um, so if you're interested in seeing some more, you can you can find him on Twitter. He's been doing some really nice graphics related to coronavirus using R. And I know he's using R because when the clocks went um, forward in April, all of his R code um, broke because he'd forgot to program in to, to handle that, which is which happens sometimes. Um, but yes, everyone has has issues occasionally. So yeah, fin Financial Times using ggplot. Another classic one is, is the BBC. So the BBC also make a lot of their graphics now in ggplot with R. Uh, and they've got a really nice example. And again, all of these are in the slides that you'll have access to these, these links. Um, but they have some fantastic examples of really nice graphics styled to their fonts, to their color scheme. Um, and they've actually, um, written quite a lot of documentation showing how they've done that as well. They've created a package called BB Plot, which um, basically shows how you can make these sorts of graphics yourself. Um, oh, has my screen sharing paused? Quite possibly, I might have knocked the button. There we go, thank you, Paul. Yes, so I'm on the BBC page now. Thank you, Paul, for spotting that. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, BB plot is fantastic. Um, if you get really into into using ggplot2 yourself and you want to have a go at creating your own fake news, feel free to have a look at the uh, BBC style guide and, and try and recreate your own BBC graphic. Um, the reason that these big companies are choosing to use something like ggplot and R for pro uh, for graphics rather than something like Excel is you can you can create graphics in a programmatic way. So if there's any sort of graphic that you have to repeat on a general basis, a regular basis, or you're having to create lots of plots for lots of different sets of data that are all quite similar, you can reuse the same sort of code. You can standardize your, um, your, your formatting across a company. So it's a really powerful, powerful tool. OK, so again, all those links are in the slides for now. Um, we're going to just actually get in and, and do some R programming. So I'm going to jump over to the um, R Studio Cloud so you can see that in more detail. Um, so don't feel like you have to follow along with this. You've got all of the slides and the material for afterwards. It's probably worth just, just watching rather than trying to copy along and then having a go when it gets to the practical. That would be my, my recommendation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a new R script. And I'm actually going to make the text a little bit bigger as well, because um, I think the text here is a little bit small. Now, I don't often use the RStudio cloud, so I don't know how busy and crashy it's going to be. If it does crash, I'll just hop over to my, my personal RStudio. But it's nice for you to see the same, um, have the same kind of working environment that I'm also having. However, this is crashing already, so that's excellent. So hopefully you've come across our packages before. These are um, sort of additional bits of code and functions that you can install onto your computer so that you can use them. So if I create a new file, here we go. And I'm just going to go into tools and global options. And I'm just going to make the appearance and the text a little bit bigger, just hopefully so you can see it a little bit clearer. OK, so again, just in case some of you are super new to R programming. What I'm going to do is I'm going to be working up here in my R script. This is where I'm going to write my code. And then when I want to execute it, I'm going to highlight all of the code I want to run. I'm going to click the run button. So we're going to be using the ggplot2 package. That's already been installed on the um, on the RStudio cloud for you. But if you want to use the functions inside the R package ggplot2, you have to load them up with the library command. 
And what the library command does is tell R that you want to use some of the functions from that package. So it kind of gets them ready to use. And again, important thing to remember is the package name is ggplot2. Okay, that two is important. Uh, and if we run that line of code, we'll just see library ggplot2. And I can check it worked because if I go over to the packages tab in RStudio and I scroll down to ggplot2, I can see it's got a tick next to it. That means it's ready to go. We can use functions from the ggplot um, library. Okay, so to create a ggplot object or to create a plot with ggplot, what we need to do is we need to, um, I guess, we have two main arguments in the first function of ggplot. So the main function for creating a, a graph or a plot is ggplot, okay? So this is what I mean, Zahid. So the package is called ggplot2, but the main function is just called ggplot. There's no two there. And that often tri trips people up the first time they use it. So the function is ggplot, and there's gonna be two main arguments. So two main settings that we're going to um, change here. We need to specify the data. So what we want to plot. And we need to specify a mapping. Okay. Now, a mapping in ggplot is just a way of relating the bits of the plot to the table. Okay. So, sort of saying the x axis, I want to be this column of the data, and the y axis, I want to be this column of the data. So, it's the way that we kind of connect up the table, the data that we're plotting, the bits of the table with the bits of the plot. Um, so it's uh, this is the thing that I think beginners sometimes find a little bit confusing, but I just like to think of it as kind of joining up the table and the graph, almost like drawing a line. Right, okay, we'll go from this column to the x-axis, and we'll go from this column to the y-axis. So this is all we need to really start making a very basic plot in R. Um, so before I show you this, I need to read in some data so that we can plot. So I'm just going to read in some data. Um, this data I've actually put on the virtual machine for you in the data folder. There's two files. There's a, a movies RDS file and a bond RDS file. We're going to start with the movies data and then we'll touch on the bond data a little bit later on. So I'm going to use the function read RDS. That's going to read in um, that file for us. RDS is a special format uh, effectively for storing R data. So it just reads in a little bit quicker. Um, and that's in the data directory. So that line of code on line four should read in the data for us and create a new variable called movies. Okay. And you can see we've got a data set of 3,600 rows, 21 variables. And if I wanted to have a quick look at that, I could use the view function with a capital V just to sort of inspect it almost as if it was an Excel sheet opening up. So what we've got here is we've actually got a bunch of data from the Internet Movies database. So uh, the rows relate to um, films that have been put on the on the Internet Movie database and we have a bunch of metadata about those films. So we know what year the film came out in, uh, the budget and the gross budget. Um, we also have the duration, so that's in minutes. So Avatar was 178 minutes long. And we've got some other nice stuff. We know the language the film was shot in, the country it was made in, um, and what it was rated. So this is when people rate movies on the Internet Movies Database between 1 and 10 or 0 and 10. This is the average rating. So of all the um, 8,000... Uh, 886,000 people that voted uh, or rated Avatar, they've got an average rating of 7.9 out of 10. So those are the main um, columns we're going to deal with in this data set for today. And there's a bunch of binary variables over here that we're not going to touch. Okay, so like I said, ggplot is the function we need to use. Two arguments, the data and the map. 
Well, the data is easy. We just need to put the name of the data set. So here I'm just going, in fact, I'll leave that up just as a reminder. Um, so the first argument is, the, is going to be the data, which is just called movies. So I'm just going to write movies. Uh, Chung Ho, not a dumb question at all. Um, is there a difference between using the arrow symbol and the equal symbol? Pretty much for 98% of the time, I would say no, there isn't actually a difference at all. I use the equal symbol a lot because I program in a lot of other languages as well as R, and equals is kind of a more um, commonly used um, assignment operator across different programming languages. Um, but you can feel free to use the arrow symbol or the equal symbol when you're assigning variables. Um, yeah, so I, I'm just going to use the equal sign. If you'd prefer to use an arrow sign, that's absolutely fine too. When when R was invented around 25 years ago, that was a single button on the keyboard. So it seemed like quite a useful assignment button. Um, we've since lost that little button, but there is a shortcut for it. So, Okay, thanks for your question, Jono. So yeah, ggplot is the function. The first argument is the data we want to actually plot. The second argument is this mapping. Now, what we need to do in this mapping is we need to somehow tell ggplot what we want to plot. So I might want to plot on the x-axis the film length, the film duration, and on the y-axis I might want to plot the rating. And then we could look at the relationship and see are longer films higher rated? So I would like my x-axis to be duration, and I would like my y-axis to be rating. Now, the syntax for the mapping, um, this mapping argument here um, is a little bit odd and I'll explain more about it when we get further into ggplot. But the way you have to pass this information is through a function called AES, okay? Now, AES stands for aesthetics. I'll show you what, what the code would look like first and then I will talk you through it. So X equals duration, Y equals rating. So this um, aesthetic function, what this is doing is this is how we define map mappings in ggplot. So what this allows us to do is this AES is effectively saying, I want to map X from the data um, I want, sorry, the x-axis from the ggplot to be mapped to the duration column in the data. So anytime we're using the AES function, it's because we're mapping something in a plot to something in the data. Um, and you can just separate everything inside the aesthetic function with a comma. So this is um, the information we need to pass in order to sort of define that relationship, right, between, between the plot and the data. Do you always need to use AES, asks Stuart. Um, if you're trying to plot something relating to the data, yes, you do. We'll see later how we can change a few things in ggplot without using AES. And one of the things we're going to talk about is when we need AES and when we don't. Basically, the bottom line, Stuart, is we need AES anytime we're using something from the data to change our plot. Okay. So what that's saying is kind of look up in the data and we're going to check, set the x-axis to the duration from the data column. So it's any time we're going back to the data set. OK, so we've got our data and we've got our mapping. And that's actually enough just to create the first step. So if I run this line, I'm going to get our first ggplot. I'm going to run it with Control and Enter. And we get, I mean, I, I could hear the gasps coming through your muted voices. Um, yes, a blank plot, not very exciting. But this is what I mean about um, ggplot being about building things up in layers. Um, the first thing we need to create a plot is we need a blank canvas. Yep, that's what you got to, few. Yes, <laughs> blank plot is good, Mike. Um, this is just the canvas, right? This is, this is where we're going to start doing our painting, putting our points, putting our lines. So it looks anticlimactic, but this is actually probably the hardest bit. All the rest uh, is nice and easy. So once you get your head around these arguments, um, you'll be flying. OK, so that's our boring plot. What sort of plot do we want to make? Well, I'm thinking we probably want some points, scatter plot. So we need to um, add a new layer to our plot. OK, if you've ever played around with Photoshop or another sort of um, image 
um, manipulation tool, they often deal with stuff in layers. So you'll have a blank canvas and then you'll just sort of add stuff in layers. Very similar here. So um, the way we add layers in ggplot is with the um, plus symbol. It needs to go at the end of the line, so line 11. And, and what that does is effectively that tells R that I haven't quite finished making my plot yet. So if it's running this line and it sees a plus at the end, it knows to expect um, some more information or another layer. So we add layers together in ggplot with the add symbol, with a plus symbol. So I'm going to start a new line. Now, the way that we add points or lines or bars or box plots, these things are collectively called geometries when in, in sort of ggplot language, okay, or geoms. And effectively, there's lots and lots and lots of different functions that all start with the, um, the word geom and then an underscore. And then you get a bunch of different options. So I know that for a scatter plot, I want the word geom point. This is going to create a scatter plot for me. So I can type or, or use that sort of selection there to, to select geom underscore point. And that will create a scatter plot for me. Now, uh, one of the another sort of important things to remember is that all of these um, things, geoms, they're actually all functions. OK, now um, I don't know if you've come across many functions in R before, um, but all functions in R um, always have round brackets at the end. So when I use the read RDS function, there are round brackets. When I use the library function, we had round brackets. So one thing people sometimes forget is they sometimes type geom underscore point and they forget to put around brackets at the end. And even if you're not actually going to pass any arguments, so if you're not changing any settings in the in the scatter plot, you still need to put those round brackets. Because if you don't, well, what's R going to think? Well, if R sees something like this, some text without any round brackets, it's going to assume it, you're asking it to find some sort of variable, something that you've already created, right? So if we want to use the geom point function, you must remember to put open and close round brackets at the end. OK, so these two lines now should be enough to get us a scatter plot. So I'm going to click run. OK, so that's added our plots, our points. So it's looking a lot more normal now, I guess, right? A bit more like a, the sort of plot we were expecting. And I mean, that's enough to get you up and running with ggplot, really. Um, so ggplot function with two arguments, data and mapping, have to go in that order, data first and then mapping. That defines our, um, our blank canvas. And then depending on what sort of plot you want to create, we're going to add different geoms. So this is a nice scatter plot. So um, I'm going to show you uh, one of the plots for now. Anyone got any questions so far on anything I've covered? If not, I will move on to a bar chart, uh, which is possibly... Sorry to interrupt. Sorry, sure. I'm just going to uh, drop off for a little bit and then come back because I've got a, a meeting on Teams yeah, now. No worries, Mike. Thanks. Have a nice meeting. Um, yes, yeah, so bar charts, uh, possibly my favourite sort of graph. Um, I'll be asking you what your favourite is later, so get thinking. Um, again, the nice thing is, once we've learned how to make one graphic in, in R, we can repeat the process. So if I wanted to create a bar chart on my movies data, I would start ggplot to create the canvas, to create that blank canvas. Oh, Paul, I was just starting to like you as well. He said pie chart in the chat. I don't think we can be friends anymore. Um, back to bar charts. Re oh, <laughs> I'm getting trolled today. 3D pie charts, someone's saying. OK, I'm going to ignore the chat for a minute. <laughs> so back to real plots. Bar charts um, are great, much better than pie charts. Uh, you can make pie charts in, in ggplot. We'll gloss over that. Oh, God, donuts. I've started you off now. I'm sorry. It's all going downhill from here. Bar charts. Um, so the ggplot function, again, same arguments, right? So we need to define our data and we need to find our mapping. Now the data um, 
is going to be the movies data again, just exactly the same. And the mapping, well, it depends on what we want to plot. So last time I did um, duration versus rating, that won't work for a bar chart. So for a bar chart, I want to know how many movies are rated sort of um, for 18 plus versus PG versus um, 12A, et cetera. So how many movies are there in each classification? So let's have a look at our data. Well, we've got a column here called classification. So we probably want that on our x-axis. That's going to be our, um, our bars. Um, yep, the, the workshops are going online at some point, I believe, Jenho. So, yep, we want the classification to go on our x-axis. Now, in the chat, anyone got any idea what do I want to put on my y-axis? So I'm making a bar chart. I want to know how many films there are in each category. So in the chat, anyone got any ideas? What would I want to put on my y-axis? Doesn't you don't have to tell me code, just kind of what, what we're actually going to be putting. So I want to say how many films are there in category 12? Yeah, some kind of count, Andrew. Exactly. Now the nice thing is in ggplot, um, with that count data, yeah, yeah, count of unique films, yeah, Chun Ho. With that count data, we don't actually have to calculate that. So if you look at our table, we've got, you know, Avatar is a 12A, Pirates of the Caribbean is a 12A, Spectre is a 12A. We don't want to have to go through that, calculate how many there are of each category and then plot. We can actually just give ggplot the x-axis, okay? And if we're doing a bar chart, ggplot will assume that we want count data on the y-axis and actually calculate that for us, which is really nice. So I'm just going to specify an x-axis here. And if I type geom underscore bar, that will give me um, the, the bar charts that we want. And that's all we need. So again, I'm not specifying the x-axis because when I generate a bar chart in ggplot, um, it will assume, if I don't specify a y-axis, um, that it, I want count data, and it will actually count that for me. So we'll actually do that summarization technique step as part of the, um, the graphics. And this is the bar chart I get. So you can see it's calculated. There's mostly a lot of 15 rated films. I wonder if we might have filtered the data because there's probably more 18 films in the data, in the actual real data dump. Um, and that's how you'd create a bar chart. Um, a side note for anyone who's a bit more advanced or starting to already ask questions like, well, what if I want to put frequency on the y-axis or what if I want to put my own count on the y-axis? If you've already calculated your y-axis, so let's say i would taken, and again, this is slightly more advanced material. So if you don't follow this, don't worry too much. This is more of an aside. Let's say I'd already calculated a summary. So if anyone's had a play with um, the dplyr package before, which is a way of doing summaries, I could say um, I could write some code which would basically take the classification data column and I could create a summary where I say summarize total equals n. Oh, ah, I probably don't have the dplyr package loaded up. Let's see. This is, there we go, just going off piste here. So let's say I had a summary table already, right, rather than the raw data. Um, so I'm going to call this um, uh, summary movies. So let's say your data was already summarized, which might happen in official statistics. You've, you've already got count data rather than raw sort of survey data. Um, if you wanted to create a bar chart here, you actually need a different function because I'll show you why. If I try to plot the movies data, um, sorry, the summary movie data with um, AESX equals um, classification and do plus G on bar, well, what happens is ggplot assumes that I want count data 
it's gone in there and it's gone well. There's one 12A, there's one 15, <laughs> there's one 18, there's one PG and there's one U, right? So not very useful. So um, if you do want to specify your Y axis, so here we would want the Y axis to be the total. Um, you actually need to use a slightly different function here. Uh, it's actually geom col, it stands for column, right? So just a rectangle. Um, and I'll mention this in my recap at the end, but it's something people tend to trip up over a little bit. So if you want to create a bar chart, if you've got raw data and you want R to do the counting for you, you need G on bar and you can just not specify the Y axis and it will do all the calculations for you. If you happen to have data that's already summarized and you want to specify the Y axis, um, this is just a slight variant of um, G on bar called G on col. Otherwise, they do exactly the same thing. It's just one, it uses the Y axis as the Y axis, and in the other one, it does the summarization for you. Okay, so I think time for a very quick quiz. Um, so let's say Sarah is trying to recreate this plot. So we've got votes on the X axis and um, rating on the Y axis. What I want you to do is have a think, look at her code here and see if you can spot any mistakes. So Sarah's actually made three mistakes. Um, so have a go, pop any messages in the chat. Um, even if someone's already said it, it's nice. Just have a go, any errors that you spot, just mention it in the chat. Because uh, it's very easy. It's, uh, it's quite fun sometimes looking at someone else's code and helping them debug it. And it's hard to... Hard to remember. Okay, so most people have spotted two of them. Yep, so a common one coming out is that the pipe should be a plus symbol. So yep, some pe um, if you've ever played with dplyr, this is an operator you use to kind of chain commands. Um, but in ggplot, we need to use the plus symbol. So well spotted. I think Andrew spotted that and uh, Paul. And um, yep, a couple of other people as well, Stuart. And then we've got, yep, yeah, no AES. So these arguments, these votes and rating come from the data. So they need to be wrapped in the AES function. So she's forgotten to put an AES in there, which Emily spotted and Mike and a couple of other people, uh, Chung, which is great. And then, yep, uh, Sally says, use geom point instead of scatter. Yep, that's great. So the, the geometry she used to create a scatter plot is actually called geom point, not geom scatter. Um, so that's those are the three mistakes. Uh, Stuart's also pointed out that you don't actually need to write data equals movies. That's true. So um, this is just the name of the function argument, which you can write in if you want, but um, you don't have to. So yeah, everyone seems on board. That's fantastic. I'm going to talk for just a tiny bit longer and then I will get you to have a go yourself, start making some plots. I just want to give you a feel for some of the other different plots you can make very quickly. And then you'll be up and running in no time. So let's look at some different plots. Now, what I will say is there is a really nice cheat sheet for ggplot. Um, if you haven't come across the cheat sheets yet, so if you go to tool um, help, and then cheat sheets, there's a list of, these are basically uh, one or two page PDF cheat sheets um, that have got lots and lots of different, um, basically summarized compressed information. And there's a really nice one on plotting called ggplot. And if you're getting a bit um, overwhelmed by the sheer number of plots you can make and thinking, how am I gonna remember that a scatter point, a scatter plot is g on point and that a bar chart is g on col, um, that PDF will really help. And also you don't have to remember these things, right? We can just use the internet and Google it. Um, but that cheat sheet you'll find helpful. And I have linked to it on the, um, ah, thank you, yep. I have linked to it on the thing as well. Sorry, that's my bad. I was just let the Zoom participants chat just uh, slip over onto my other screen. Thanks, Emily. Okay, so let's have a go at histogram. Now, so what might we want to do here? Let, we might want to look at a histogram of um, film duration. So are most films, how long are most films? How long is the average film? Are there a bunch of really long films? Are most of them short? We can answer lots of questions like that with a histogram. Now, again, you're gonna get a bit sick of me saying this. We start with a blank canvas, all right? So 
we've got our data argument and our mapping argument. Okay, let's fill them in. Well, the data is just the movies data again. And our mapping, well, we know we need to write AES. And then for a histogram of film duration, again, it's one of those where we're actually going to let ggplot calculate the y-axis for us. So usually on a histogram, you would have um, x, uh, the x-axis, and then on the y-axis, you would have count or maybe frequency. Um, so all we need to do here is specify just the x-axis, which here is going to be the film duration, which is just called duration. And again, using a plus to add those layers. And then the geom we want, I mean, I can just start typing geom and then wait until the list pops up uh, and that will help me find what it is. It's geom histogram, which you probably could have guessed. Can you specify bins for the x-axis, Rory? Yes, you can. Um, I'll show you that now. So the default plot looks like this. Um, quite chunky bins. What Roy means by bins is sort of the, the, the rectangle width. So how many kind of groups that histogram has generated and how wide those groups are, sometimes called bins. Um, so that's specified our bins. So I guess we can see off there that the average film is just over 100 minutes, about 120 minutes, I think the average is in this data set, which is about two hours, which, which feels about right. We can specify the bin width um, with an argument called bin width, which you put just in that geom histogram. So you can specify either the number of bins or, or bin width. Stuart, no idea. Anyone else know why they're called bins? I just think of them as actually like boxes or yeah, bins, categories, things that you just chunk things into. Um, if anyone knows the answer to Stuart's question, please tweet at Triangle Girl so I can find out <laughs> or post in the chat. Um, yeah, so bin width. So let's say I wanted my bin width. So effectively, I wanted films to be split into 10 minute intervals. I could say bin width equals 10, and they've gone a little bit narrower. If I wanted kind of a bin for each hour category, right, I would go up to a bin width of 60. And that's going to mean that each of these bins represents 60 minutes, okay? So obviously that's quite chunky. So the bin width you can specify. So I could have quite a small bin width, but just look at five minutes. Um, each, each rectangle is effectively a width of five minutes uh, or one minute, and you'll effectively get more and more jagged. Okay, so that's a histogram. Uh, um, do you pipe in ggplot? I personally prefer it to be providing autocomplete for variable names. Ah, Chun, that's a really good point, actually. So um, when we get into playing with um, data columns inside our geoms in a little bit, so like coloring the histogram based on a particular variable, we'll see how that works then. Um, you don't pipe in ggplot because we use the layers instead. However, you'll notice that I didn't actually refer to that as movies dollar duration. I just referred to it as the column name. So ggplot, like the kind of dplyr world, Junho, um, effectively, if you've defined once you've defined the data here, it will expect column names just as they are, right? So you don't have to say column name duration equals. So when I actually start specifying something, so ggplot movies. Ooh, AES X equals. So I can't actually tab out at the moment, but I think I can later on when I'm making plots. So other than the first line, um, yep, your autocomplete should work. Um, we'll check that when we get onto colors after the break. Okay, just want to show you one more plot type before I let you loose, and that's box plots. Uh, really like box plots. So um, again, ggplot, first argument is the data. Second argument is the mapping. So what am I going to create a plot of? Well, I'm going to look at the, the rating for different classifications. So what I mean is, are 12A movies generally better than 15 rated movies? So on the x-axis, my boxes, I'm going to want the classification classification, which I really struggle spelling 
classification, which is Chung Ho's point. Stacked bar plot, we can show you later, Zahid, yet. Y equals, um, is going to be the rating, the movie rating. And then to create a box plot, guess what? Geo and box plot, right? So you can already start making a lot of different um, different plots. Now, one thing I haven't told you about plots yet, you can actually save um, your plot as a variable, okay? So say I wanted to store this as a variable called my underscore box plot. Let me just delete my plots. So if I run this line of code, nothing appears immediately, but you'll see I've now got a variable called my box plot. Um, and this is useful for a couple of things. It means if I type my box plot, the plot will appear. It also means that if I want to take a plot and then add some more layers to it, so if I kind of want to make a basic plot and then pause and then sort of start editing that plot a little bit later on, I can do. And it also means that we can um, GG, we can actually um, save our plots in a programmatic way. Uh, forest plots, I'll have to look at that during the break, Rory. If we get time, I will try and cover that, sure. Okay, so what I want to do before the break is um, just show you one last thing, which is how to change titles and things. And we can do this with another layer. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually just to show you that we can use variables. I'm actually going to start editing my, um, my sort of saved box plot rather than using this all over again. I'm actually going to use this my box plot variable just to show you that, it, that you can. So the function that is going to be your friend is called labs. You can specify lots of different things in there. The title. You can specify a subtitle. Um, you can also specify um, the X axis. So say we want to say film categories instead of in classification. We can specify the Y axis. Let's say I wanted to say um, ratings between zero to 10. And I can specify um, a caption as well. So just within that one function, you can specify as many of these as you want. If you only want to change the caption, you can do that. Um, you can specify these in any order you like, as long as you're using the argument name. So title equals X equals. And this labs function you can use to change any of your settings. So now we've got our nice plot made by me. And finally, if we want to save our plots, you've got a couple of different options. As you get more confident in R, um, I'd recommend you use a function called ggsave. Um, this basically allows you to take a variable you've saved, like my box plot, and um, specify it. With a, with a file name where you want to save it. But when you're just starting off, I wouldn't bother with this. I would just use the export button, which is over here. You can click export, save as image, decide where you want to save it, give it a name, change the aspect ratio, all of that sort of stuff. PNG, TIFF, SVG. Um, so once you, when you're starting out, I would say just use the button. It's great. If you ever get into the scenario where you're having to generate, um, let's say you're creating a different plot for every single LSOA in the UK or different, uh, different wards, um, then you probably want to use something a little bit more programmatic. And that's when you would want to use a function like ggsave. But if you're just making one or two plots, the button's absolutely great. So you can see in my files, um, I've now got, uh, where's it gone? Ah, awesome R plot, there we go. Okay, I've been talking for ages. Um, I think it's time for you to have a go at some stuff. Um, so what we'll do is we're gonna have um, a 10 minute practical, and then after that, we're gonna have a break. So what I'd like you to do is if you go into the practicals folder, if you're working in the RStudio cloud, 
the two practicals. You can open it in, it in the PDF format. That's probably best. The R Markdown format has also got the solutions hidden in it. So if you're getting a bit stuck, you can have a nosy in the R Markdown folder. But the practical PDF has got the questions. What I'm going to get you to do is um, create some basic scatter plots. I'm going to teach you a new function. And then we're going to get you to have a go at making some histograms. OK. So we're going to have 10 minutes playing with this um, practical. I will try and be quiet um, and leave you to it. So if you want to pop music on for 10 minutes to work, that's fine. Um, and feel free to ask me lots of questions in the chat and uh, let me know uh, when you're finished. Um, the, the, there's a little bit of getting you to play with colours at the end as well, but I'll teach you more about colours after the break. So we'll spend 10 minutes on practical and uh, feel free to ask questions.
Lawrence. So if you haven't finished the material, don't worry. All of the answers are in the R Markdown document. What I'll do is I'll just ask someone if they don't mind to unmute, and then we'll just have a, a quick natter through it together. So I'll do the, the typing, um, but uh, but I'll leave uh, someone else to do the, the chatting. So um, perhaps, Paul, would you mind um, if I just asked you to unmute and we could just have a little bit of a quick chat about these exercises? I, I knew that being chatty would, would come back and, <laughs> and bite me. Um, Too late. <laughs> okay, uh, let me, sorry, I, I've got two screens on the it's go. It's fine. Well. Yep. Me uh, too. Let me share my screen <laughs> so everyone can cool. see. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just, we can just have a, a quick natter about this. It's no pressure. Um, sorry, I just need to find my share screen. Everything's gone Zoom. <laughs> you know what it's like. Cool. Okay. So. Um, what we're doing here. So we're making a scatter plot. Um, it just says a basic scatter plot, doesn't it? It does. And we've already got the movies all set as well. So that's yep. a good start. So uh, what scatter plot did you make, Paul? So I just went with AES. Yeah. X equals votes, Y equals rating. Yep. And then uh, a plus. Yep. And then geom underscore point. I almost wrote scatter then. Sherry, <laughs> my brain. <laughs> with our yeah, with our two non well, our, our normal brackets. Yeah. And then plus uh, labs for yeah. labels. Yep. Yeah. And then I went x equals number of votes. And I've written that in quotes. Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, y equals quote rating open bracket out of 10, close bracket, quote. Yep. Uh, and then another comma, yep. and then title equals comparison of votes to rating. A very, very exciting yeah, very title. Very exciting title. You're, you're feeling inspired <laughs> there, Paul. Yeah. And then a, just a another plus outside of those close brackets. Yep. Uh, and then why limb. Yep, sorry, I'm trying to do two things at once. Yeah. While in, yep. And then open brackets, zero, comma, ten. Super. Brackets. So what's that actually doing? So that's setting. So uh, if you run it without that while in, you can see that it kind of, the top of the graph is ten and it doesn't actually kind of show it. So it fills that whole space. And mm -hmm. the while the in, zero to ten, gives you like a little bit of, kind of space either side of the that's yeah, it so you've got a little bit by swipping between them yeah so effectively the rating isn't going all the way down to zero because no one effectively rated there isn't an average rating of zero so if you want to specify those clearly yep that's that's super um i don't want to go through all of these anything else that you did uh did you get through to the bonus bit on the colors yes so uh should we go for the most yeah, let's go, complicated for it. One. let's go for it. Go for it. Go straight uh, in. I say most complicated. So then we have uh, if you do GG plot, yeah, open brackets, movies, comma, AES, open brackets, X equals classification. Yeah. And then a comma, and then fill equals classification. Okay. And close those brackets, and then plus geom bar. And if you run that, it's color coded it depending on the classification. Fantastic. Yep. So we're going to have a look at this in terms of colors a little bit now. Um, was it you, Paul, that asked the question about specifying those colors specifically? Yeah. So if I wanted 12A to be green instead of red, and I, I say this, I'm actually colorblind. So I'm, I'm just going to kind of <laughs> guess what colors they're not. Uh, so and then 15 to be like gray or something. How yep. can I how can I kind of set that up? Well, I mean, the first thing is uh, on a good point, the ggplot default color palette is chosen to be colorblind friendly. So hopefully they are distinguishable for you. Um, yep, yeah, so it's a little bit more complicated, not something I want to cover today, but the function you'll want to have a look at is fill scale. Uh, hang on, I can never, I always have to Google this one. Scale fill manual, 
fill manual. And what that's saying is you want to change the scale of the fill parameter and you want to manually define that rather than use specifying like two colors and, and spinning across it or, or the brewer actually uses a bunch of predefined palettes. So manual basically means you want to say, I want this to be this. Um, and then what I would do is I would just Google for an example with that solution because the syntax is a little bit annoying. You have to use what we call named vectors to specify 12a equals. But those colors, you can specify a bunch of built-in R colors or hex colors, um, all sorts, really. Um, so have a look at that. Oh. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry to butt in. Uh, would you be able to just quickly show people uh, the whole thing about how when you just try color? Change, yeah, 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 after the break, come into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three. AES and non-ES on it. Yeah, I'll get to that. In fact, now is actually a really good time for a break, I think. So we'll just take, um, let's take eight minutes. Let's come back at quarter past three, if that's all right with everyone. So just take a quick break to have a cup of tea and, um, and we'll kick off with, with uh, that, that secret example at quarter past three. Sound good? Ready to hit some more GG plots. Hey, hi, Jackie. Hi, Sally. Yep, I can see a couple of people coming back. Helen's back as well. And uh, if I can see Paul's back, and Mike, fantastic, yeah. So we've got people coming back, which is always good. Um, so I'll just share my screen again. Can I just say, I, I, uh, I love the selections of colors uh, that they've available. Um, oh, you mean the actual colors that are built into R? Yes, uh, I, I, I've gone for steel blue. It's not quite blue steel, but it'll do. Yeah, we're quite a big fan of fire brick within Jumping Rivers. That's a quite nice <laughs> this shade of red here. So I've just mocked up an example, and we will go into colours if, if people haven't seen these before in a, in a second. Um, but yeah, there's there's um, again, this is slightly out of scope of the workshop, but um, Paul was asking about manually redefining those categories. Effectively, you need to use the scale fill manual function and I always look up the help page for this as you can see that's just what I've done here because I can never remember the syntax for it um, and if I scroll down to the example you can see a nice example where they've used the values argument and they've specified that eight needs to be red four needs to be blue so in my version here I've just done 12 eight is equal to fire brick which is a predefined color in R you can see all the different colors with that argument colors there's uh, maroon one two three and four but apparently no maroon five which is very sad um and and lots of different predefined r colors for you there's also um you can use hex colors so if you've got predefined um hex colors for your um branding internally you can use those so Hash, uh, for some reason, I know that A6, you know what, C5 is, is duck egg blue. So um, there you go. So you can use predefined R colors or you can use um, hex colors as well. So aesthetics, let's talk about them generally. Um, there's lots of different ways we can kind of style and, and change our plots. So we can look at the, the color or the fill arguments and they're, they're slightly different and I'll explain those in a sec. We can also, to look at the shapes of the plots. So do we want circles on our, on our scatter plots or triangles or squares or stars? We can look at the size. So we do want our plots, uh, our points on our scatter plot to be really big. Uh, how thick do we want our lines to be? Uh, what type of line do we want? Do we want dashed lines or dotted lines? Um, and there's also a parameter called alpha. Can anyone guess from the emoji or from their R experience what the alpha parameter might um, actually manipulate or change? So we've looked at color, or we will look at color, shape, and size, and line type. Any guesses what the alpha parameter might change? If you think you know, pop a message in the chat. Or if you've got a guess, pop a message in the chat. Uh, someone said transparency, someone says margins of error. Transparency is correct. So transparency controls how see-through a bar is or a point is or a box plot. And the reason that's useful is, as I said, in ggplot, we build up layer on layer on layer. And you might actually have 
uh, a scatter plot with a line of best fit over um, over the top or you might have um, a box plot but you've also got the data underneath the box plot so um, that alpha parameter is good for dealing with multiple layers uh, and also dealing with if you've got a scatter plot and you've got a million, three million points, it's going to be very crowded. So that alpha parameter will kind of allow you to see how um, how dense that scatter plot is, if that makes sense. And we're going to look at all of these now. So let me move my slides out of the way and we'll just go straight back into the um, into our studio. So we'll look at colours first. Colours are great. So I'm going to go back to my scatter plot from right at the very start. I'm just going to copy and paste it down because I'm a data scientist and I'm lazy. There we go. Okay, scatter plot. So um, we've seen uh, at the end, if you got to the end of the um, practical, you might have had a look at the, the fill argument. Uh, I'm going to talk about colour first and I'm going to explain the difference between the two in a second. So a G on point, if we want to change the colour of all of these points, we can use the, um, the colour argument. Now, you'll be pleased to know that both the American and the English spellings are accepted, which is nice. So if I wanted to change my scatter plot so um, that all of these points were um, red, I could do that. I'll do that in a second, actually. What I'm going to do first is I'm actually going to try and change the colour of these points based on the data. So let's say I wanted my scatter plot with duration versus rating, but I wanted the, um, the colour of the points to represent the, the duration as well which is perhaps a little bit um, unnecessary. It's already mapped on the x-axis, but just having a play. So duration is a continuous variable going from zero to around 300. And if we wanted to color based on that variable, we could type AES color equals duration. Okay. And what that will do is that will color each point. Oh, I've put quotes around the word duration because I'm not thinking, which has um, caused everything to go red. Uh, and that's because ggplot was looking for a column called quote duration and is not really finding one. So let me just write that correctly. Okay. So AES color equals duration. So if you remember the AES is the function we looked at earlier. What that does is that's used anytime we're mapping or, or relating any bit in the plot to any bit in the data, so any column in the data. So here I'm saying that I want the colour of the points to depend on the column duration. So as the films get longer, the, um, the, the points get lighter in their blue. Okay. So this enables us to colour based on a column. And that's why we need the AES. We need it anytime we're relating the plot to the data. Now, because duration is a continuous in, um, variable, it's automatically decided to do that on a scale for me, right? So we've got a darker shade to a lighter shade. If I, on the other hand, wanted to color the points to represent the classification, so these are the different categories, right? I could change this to classification. And what's going to happen is um, this will actually choose categorical variables. So now we've got a categorical variable, we get um, five distinct colors rather than a scale of colors going from light to dark. Now Stuart's just asked in the chat, how do you change light to dark direction? Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head, I would imagine that it's buried within the scale color continuous function. So um, these are kind of out of scope for the workshop today, but um, the scale functions are ways of changing all of these different settings that you've been talking about. We, you would want to change the colour and um, we're dealing with continuous data, so I'd have a look at that. Mike says, is it easy to change the colour that it shifts from? It, yeah, it depends on what you're doing. So. Um, have a look if you're interested in really specifying these gradients have a look at the help file for the scale color continuous function you can see how you can specify um, 
basically you'd have to write your own function that would return a continuous color scale, but there are helper functions to help you do that. You can also choose a predefined color palette, which is normally what I recommend to people starting. So you can use something like our color brewer to specify a specific palette. Um, so yeah, have a look at that, that function, Mike and Stuart, but yeah. We're just going to focus on using the default colors for this workshop. So, yep, so we've created a scatter plot and we noticed that because our column, this column is categorical, we get distinct colors. Uh, when this was um, continuous, we got a, a gradient of colors. So what if I want to make all of the colors, all of the scatter points, a particular color? So let's say I want the color of the points to be, um, let's say sky blue. Okay. So if I type sky blue in here, you'll see that we get a problem. This is the same problem I had earlier. So this is definitely not sky blue. This is um, a, def a red. The reason that it's gone red is this is the default color in ggplot, this red. And you'll see that it's colored all of my data. And in the, um, the legend, it says the color is sky blue. So effectively what's happening here is ggplot is looking for a column in the data called sky blue. It's not really finding one. So it's effectively creating a column called sky blue and setting, uh, uh, setting all of them equal to true um, and then effectively that means that all of these are going to be the same color so this is not what we want to do and the reason um, that this is not done the behavior that we expected is because we put it in the AES function now remember anytime you use the AES function we're mapping the plot to the data so this is why ggplot was looking in the data to try and find this column called sky blue which doesn't exist so if we just want to change all of the points to be sky blue, we actually need to do this outside of AES. Okay. And this is a really big point. So if you remember just one thing from today, this is what I would get you to try and remember, which is if you're linking the plot and the data, it needs to go inside that AES. That AES defines a mapping. It's like joining the bits together. If you're changing um, settings for the whole plot, so you want all of the points to be blue, or you want all of the plots to be size, uh, all of the points to be size six, um, you would want to set that outside the AES. Um, so just anytime you try and decide, do I need AES or not, just think, well, am I trying to use my data to change the plot, or am I just trying to change the plot to make it look pretty? Okay. And that's the big key thing on whether to use AES or not. Really important point, and I will remind you throughout the rest of the session. So yeah, big shouty. So inside AES, using columns of the data to style. So color equals classification. That's a column of the data. If you're just using fixed styling, you want it outside the AES, so just color is blue. Okay. So shapes, lots of different shapes, uh, well, uh, 25, I think, in um, R. I seem to have lost some of them here. Uh, four, five, six, why has it gone that weird way? That's really odd. Um, so your default shape is shape one, which is um, a circle. You can also specify um, square or triangle or any of these sorts of shapes. Now, you'll notice that some of these are filled in red so there are certain shapes which have just got one color. So these are the first 20 shapes. So shape zero all the way to shape 20, effectively you've got the color argument. And that's the only argument you can use to change the color of that shape. So when we change the points to be um, red, they all went red. These shapes here are special. They actually have two attributes. So you can change the color which is actually kind of that outline. And you can change the fill as well. Um, so some people like to use this um, to highlight outliers. So they might color all of the points light blue, but they might put like a red outline around um, the outliers. 
So just be aware that with your shapes, if you're using um, one of these later shapes, you can actually set a fill attribute as well. And I'll show you how to do this in a sec, but I'll show you now. So let's say I want to just change the shape for all of these. So I'm just going to take this again. So here I'm going to have um, the shape is um, that nice diamond shape, which is shape nine. So the way I would do this is inside my G on point, I would type shape equals nine. Now, because um, I'm just changing the, the, the styling for all of the points, and I'm not changing it based on the data, I don't need that AES uh, function. And you'll see that has changed the shape for all of the points from that circle to this sort of open diamond. Now is also a good time to introduce the size attribute. We can also make these bigger. So size three makes them bigger. I think the default is size one. So you can effectively make this smaller or bigger as you need. Um, so you can choose the size uh, of the shape and you can also choose the shape, the shape type. Now, sorry, someone got a question. No, nope. okay, thought I had someone unmute themselves. So um, what we can do with the shape argument is we could also change the shape based on the data. So let's say instead of setting all of the shapes to be a particular shape, I might want the shape to change based on the category. Now, because this is part of the data, I'm going to need to use the AES function to um, pass this through. Because remember, anytime we're referring to the data, we need to use that AES argument. OK, so let's run that and see what happens. So this is actually a little bit small, so I'm going to increase the size. Now, I want to increase the size for all of the points not based on the data. I just want to change them all to size three or four. So I'm going to do that outside of the AES argument because the size I want to change for all of them. The shape I want to change based on the data. OK, that's maybe a bit too big. Let's go size three. OK, so you can see how we can change um, the shape based on the classification. Now, obviously, you need to be a little bit sensible about what you're trying to plot. So if you try and map like a continuous variable to shape, that's not going to work. Um, you're going to have to do it with categorical data because um, shapes are kind of categorical classes. You don't have an infinite number of shapes. So we can use the shape argument. We can use the size argument. We can use the color argument. Uh, and then the only other thing I want to show you is this is quite murky. I might, let's, let's make this a bit prettier. So uh, we've got our shape from classification. I'm also going to change the color of the points to be the classification. I'm going to put that on a new line so we can see it. So color equals classification. We've got size three. So let's have a look at that. It does look quite manky, this plot, to be honest, uh, but I'm sure your data will look much prettier. If we wanted to change this, this transparency, the see-throughness, um, in fact, maybe it's better off doing it in non-colored. I'm going to get rid of this, actually. I think it'll look more, more obvious what, I've, what I'm doing. Uh, that's with the alpha parameter. Uh, I can set alpha equal to, say, 0 0.6. And that will make the points a little bit transparent. So hopefully you can see these have gone a little bit more see-through, um, which is quite useful when you've got very stacked plots. So we've had a very quick look at these different settings you can change. There's loads of different types that you can change. We've looked at shape, we've looked at uh, size, alpha, and we've looked at color. And the big point to remember is if you're mapping to the data, it goes inside the AES. If you're changing the settings for everything, it goes outside the AES. Stuart, yeah, great question. Is alpha between zero and one? Yes, it is. Should have gone through that. Thank you. So if I set alpha equals zero, we basically get blank plots. This is very, very transparent, translucent. And then alpha equals one is, is fully. OK. So I just want to check people are still awake. So I have another quick quiz. So um, 
we've got a plot here. We've got the year that a film came out in and their rating. And we've got um, some different settings have been changed. So the colours have been changed and some other things have been changed. So what I'd like you to do is work out what are the three missing gaps here. So this is the code to create this plot, but I've just taken a few of the arguments out. So have a go, see if you can work out what missing gap one, two and three are and pop it in the chat. Ah, and I like Mike's bit of code. What Mike's done is he's um, changed the alpha parameter, the transparency based on the rating, but because uh, alpha's between zero and one, he had to transform the data first. And luckily rating is between zero and 10. Um, that's very nice, Mike, great work. Uh, let's have a look at what your what your your plot looks like. Hmm, why has it gone blank? Oh yeah, I forgot the G on points. <laughs> Sorry, I realise I've taken the quiz question down. <laughs> I'll open it up again. I got too distracted by Mike's uh, Mike's plot. Okay, so have a go at this quiz and pop your answer in the chat. What do you think the missing bits are for one, two, and three? Just to check you're still awake and with me. And just to give you a feel for the different sorts of arguments you can change. Um, you can see with a plot like this, um, the transparency is quite key. If you didn't have the transparency, it would be harder to kind of see what's going on. Ah, lovely. Yep, we're getting some answers through. Yep, so, yep, fantastic, Helen. So, yep, the first um, argument here, classification, well, we can look at classification. We can look at this legend and see, ah, looks like they've changed the color here. So this could be color and it's inside the AES, which makes sense because we're referring to the data. Then we've got the size argument. Uh, and again, we can kind of look at the legend and go, well, look, this is defining the shape, this, the size of the circle. And this is the votes, and this needs to be inside the AES, but it's already done for us, so that would be votes. And then this mysterious thing that we've set as 0 0.3, yep, is the alpha parameter, transparency. Fantastic. Okay, I've just got one or two more things to show you, uh, and then we'll have a practical, and then um, I guess we can kind of wrap up and do a sort of extended Q&A. So I want to show you two things before we kind of go on to the final practical. The first is faceting, um, which is basically creating lots of smaller plots based on the data. Um, that's really powerful. And for me, when I first started playing with ggplot, that was the thing that made me think, wow, I really want to use this. And we'll also talk briefly about themes. We won't go into custom themes, but I'll just show you how you can use some out of the box ggplot themes. So firstly, um, faceting. What do I mean by that? Well, let's have a look at our um, histogram of duration. So we're looking at a histogram of movie duration. So ggplot, you know this now, you know the basics. So our data is the movies, which I can't spell, the mapping, the AES. Well, with a histogram, we only need to specify the x-axis. And we want that to be the duration and then our geometry the sort of um, plot object we want to add is, is a geom histogram okay now maybe we want to change our bin widths um, i'm going to set my bin width equal to 10 just make them a little bit narrower or maybe five okay so we've got a, um, a histogram of duration now let's say that i wanted to know um our different film categories, different lengths. So, you know, you'd think that a, a PG movie is generally intended for children. You might imagine that they might be shorter than a 15 movie. Okay. Now we could look at this with a, with a box plot. We could compare them with um, duration on the x-axis and we could look at um, the, uh, 
duration on the y-axis. However, that will just give us the sort of um, the summary statistics, right? You can compare the means very easily. You can pay, compare, compare the interquartile range, but um, you can't really compare the, um, the actual distributions. So let's say we wanted to compare those distributions in more detail. The way we do this in R is with a function called facet wrap. Now, what facet wrap does is it will create lots of different plots based on a column in your data. Now, this is the one bit where the syntax is a little bit different to what we've seen before. And it's the one exception where you don't actually need to specify AES to talk about the data. And that's because um, you can't really wrap based on color or wrap based on um, it's, it's got to come from the data, really. Um, so I guess this is the one exception where you don't need that AES. And again, um, I guess the thing to make just with R generally is you don't have to remember everything off the top of your head, right? If you could remember that it's called faceting, you can go and way in Google ggplot facet and find 20 different examples and slides. Um, so don't, don't worry about remembering the syntax off your top of your head. Um, but the way this is tend to have done is with a, a tilde symbol, this little squiggle here, that shift and normally the hash symbol on your keyboard. It's called the tilde officially, um, or, or the squig squiggle as I like to think of it. Um, and that's used to represent relationships in R. It's used a lot in statistical modeling to define linear regression um, relationships. Uh, we're going to use it here to tell R that we want to facet based on that particular variable. So a little bit of um, a syntax thing, but uh, you will get used to it. So what this has done, and I'll, I'll zoom it so you can see it's bigger. Effectively, it's created an individual histogram for each category. So we've got a histogram for each of these, and this is going to allow us to then compare these histograms in small plots each and look across them. Um, and I think this is really nice. Um, you can also use a function called facet grid, and that actually allows you to specify both an x-axis and a y-axis. So if you're dealing with age and gender, you could specify that you wanted, you know, all different age categories going one way and you wanted gender going another. So you can actually do two, which is really nice. If you want to use two, you need to use facet grid. For today, we'll just use, use facet wrap. Um, some questions in the chat. Mike wants to know what the difference between facet wrap and facet wrap is. Facet wrap. Um, so that seems to be an object rather than um, an actual function. So this is the facet wrap with a capital F. I've never used Mike. I don't think it's um, I don't think it's a function you would use. I think it's more something under the hood and ggplot. So the reason you might want to use something like facet wrap with a capital F, capital W, Mike, is if you were quite a long way into your R journey and you were writing an R package and you wanted to kind of change the behavior of facet wrap for a specific class. So you're doing something quite complicated with our packages. That's all good. I, I, I don't need it at all. I, I was just typing in facet and yep. it gave up that as an option. I was like, ha, ah, but I'll, I'll just stay away from that. So. That's fine. Yep, great question. It's not actually one I've seen before, but looking at it, it's basically something under the hood and ggplot. So not something you as a user would need to touch. Um, other questions, Paul said, uh, yep. Fantastic. Yeah, he's just rewritten the plot. Uh, Rory, would you use the facet wrap to do correlation matrix panel to show the regression between independent variables and regression modeling? Yes, or you could do, um, there's geom heat maps and tile maps of all sorts like that. If you're interested in statistical mapping, just have a quick Google Rory around using ggplot around correlation um, matrices. There's lots of different options for you there. Um, yeah, Paul, actually, your point is, is quite um, quite important, so I will just go over this now. So we, we all like Mike's, Mike's lovely plot, right? Let's, let's start a section. Mike's awesome plot. Okay, so this is Mike's awesome plot. Uh, can't, can't speak, sorry. Mike's awesome plot. And um, Paul has actually recreated his plot and written it differently okay 
So we'll play a little bit of, I'm going to call it Paul's inferior version. <laughs> no, they're actually both, they're both, um, they're actually both great ways of creating this plot and both, both perfectly good. Um, so if you're playing spot the difference here, Mike has defined the alpha parameter right in the GG plot argument. Paul has defined it just in the G on point argument. Okay. So um, both of these will work. They'll actually create identical plots. So there's Mike's. In fact, let's do a labs so I can tell our title. And we'll do a So there's Paul's and there's Mike's. Okay, so they look the same. So what I'm going to do now is um, <laughs> I'm going to change. What can I? What can I add? Actually, I'm going to change the type of plot it is just to try and make this a little bit easier for myself. I'm going to do a box plot instead, just to try and show you an example. But I'm going to keep the same the the things the same. I'll just change this to classification. So we've got two plots effectively, Mike's version where he's defining the alpha parameter in the top in that first first uh, line. And we've got Paul's version where he's defining it a little bit later on. Okay, so there's Mike's, oh, the alpha doesn't. I'm gonna use color instead just for a second. I know this seems contrived. Uh, just as a quickie, can we mm -hmm. use fill on? Uh, how would that work if we tried to use fill on a box chart? Like, would it be on the interquartile range or would there be separate things for each? Or Yep, great point. Let's have a look now. Um, so, so color just as the outline, as you can see. So we get the outline of the interquartile, interquartile range. We get the mean bar. We get the outliers all colored in. If you specify the fill as well, it's getting long now, I'm going to put it on a new line so you can keep seeing. We specify the fill as well, we get the actual centers filled in. Okay, so that hopefully answers your question. In terms of should I put it up here or should I put it down here? These two actually do exactly the same thing, right? So Mike's and Paul's versions look identical. The reason it changes is if we want to add more layers on top of each other. So let's say I want a box plot and I want some geom, a scatter plot as well. And I need a plus after there and I'll need a plus after there. Okay, now this looks a bit silly because basically it's put it all the plots on top of each other, but you'll, you'll see my point in a second. So in Mike's plot, the dots have changed color as well, right? The box plots and all of those points have changed color. In Paul's version, the box plots have changed color, but the points are all black. Okay. So I'm going to leave you to think about that for a second. So these two bits were identical before I added G on points. And then when I added G on point, they did different things. So why are Mike's plot and Paul's plot different? What's going on? Any guesses? Because uh, on my one, it's saying that uh, everything's together uh, and it's being affected by that. Whereas with Paul's, it's the, the points with, with the changing uh, and, and then the box plot is separate from the points. And, and so it's only picking that up there. Whereas for me, it was, if that's right, Oh, I don't yeah. Know. Sorry. yeah, that makes sense. And Andrew said something similar in the chat. Effectively, Mike's aesthetic is for the whole plot. And this is what it really comes down to, Mike. So when you change um, anything in GG plot right at this very top, it's going to filter through to every single geometry that you add. OK, so anytime I add another geom, it's going to the technically it says we inherit the aesthetic that's the technical term for it basically this color it's like it being in that bracket and in that bracket yeah so effectively um all of these geometries inherit anything that's specified up in this canvas they're sort of like default settings 
Well, in Paul's version, the X and Y, obviously we want that to be standard throughout all of the geometries, um, but the color was only specified here. So that means when you add a point, it's not gonna kind of inherit that color classification. Um, and there's no right or wrong way. It just depends on the sort of plot you're making. So if you want everything to be colored based on classification, you're absolutely fine to specify it at the top and not have to specify it in every single different layer. However, if you want to color some layers based on one color and some some layers you're just going to color all black, then um, you probably don't want to specify it in ggplot because it will get inherited all the way through, if that makes sense. And if we wanted to change balls, we can just add um, AES color equals classification in there. And then we'll get exactly the same. So these two bits of code are doing exactly the same thing. Mike's defined it at the top. So actually it's kind of bled through to the other geometries. Um, in Paul's version, because it wasn't specified here, if he wants to set the color to be classification for each plot type, he has to do that individually. That's quite a nice point to pick up on. Okay, final thing I want to tell you about before we have a practical and then a kind of wrap up. Themes. Um, so themes are quick and easy ways to add style to your plot. There's eight built-in themes with ggplot. So this is a data set. I'll show you the data set first, actually. Um, so bond, bond equals read RDS. Um, and the file is data slash bond.rds. The bond data is quite fun. It's a list of all of the different James Bond movies, the actor who played them, um, how many people they killed in each movie, how many relationships they had in each movie, and how many alcohol units they consumed. So someone sat down and watched all Bond movies and went, oh, that's another three units and uh, added that to the database. Um, and then we've got their nationality. And uh, when we at Jumping Rivers teach statistical modeling, we have a lot of fun looking at any relationships between nationality and alcohol unit consumption, which is which is quite fun. Today, we're just gonna make a couple of plots. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm going to create a plot of the number of kills uh, in relation to the alcohol units. So does, does Bond um, kill more when, when he's had a few um, booze consumed? Yeah, it would be nice to see that with the IMDb rating. Yeah, I, I'll if I, I'll get out in a join from Deeply later and um, do some maths and get back to you, Mike. <laughs> um, okay, ggplot bond. So this time we're using a different data set. Our mapping, like I said, we'll look at the relationship between alcohol and number of people that bond is taking out. So on the x-axis, we want kills. And on the y-axis, we want alco. Oh, I can't spell alcohol. It's always embarrassing. Alcohol. I went into maths because I can't spell. So alcohol units. OK. And I'm going to make a scatter plot. That's a geom underscore point. I'm going to color based on the actor as well. And because actor is a data, part of the data, I need the AES. So here's a nice plot. It's actually we can see different number of kills in movies. It's actually more related to the actor. I think um, I think Daniel Craig has uh, well certainly peaked out on the alcohol units consumption. Um, but we're not talking about the plot now. We want to talk about the style and the themes. And like I said, there's a bunch of different themes built into ggplot. So there's actually about eight of them. And the way we add a theme is the same way that we add anything else in ggplot. We use the plus symbol. Uh, and theme underscore will tell me the um, default themes. Not all of these are actually themes. Um, some of these are functions, but BW, classic, dark, gray, um, light, uh, minimal, and void are all the default options. So if I do theme underscore BW, um, it just puts quite a nice black and white um, perspective, no gray in there. Um, theme minimal is quite nice just a bit more of a minimalistic type plot 
and there's also um, theme void, which is a really quick way to get rid of everything on your plot, which you might think is a bit odd, but actually I've been developing a lot of infographics in uh, ggplot recently. So making um, sort of counts of people and icon type things and waffle plots. And for those, you don't actually need an X or a Y axis. So theme void can be quite useful if you're doing anything. And I guess pie charts, if anyone wants to make a 3D pie chart. Um, Helen says, can you specify data tips? So if you hover over a mouse and a dot, it tells you what movie it is. Great question, Helen. Not um, specifically within basic ggplot. Um, I can show you this if the plotly um, command function is installed. It is. So plotly is a completely different way of making plots in R, Helen. It's really nice because it creates interactive plots. However, you've just spent the last two hours with me learning how to create ggplot. So you don't want to have to go away and learn a different type of plotting in R. However, there is, um, there is a savior in that plotly, which is a different type of plotting in R, um, can handle plots already created in ggplot. So let me show you quickly. We're going off on a tangent here, uh, which I always enjoy. So let's call this data set bond equal, uh, um, kills equals. So this, if I run this, then I've got, ah, let's choose a different theme, theme black and white. We've got our kills. And if I type kills in, we've got a variable now, which is representing that plot that we've created. Okay. So this whole plot is stored in one variable called kills. Now, if I type the function ggplotly, which is a function from the Plotly library instead, so from a different package, and pass it my kills data, what it will do is it will take the plot that I've created in ggplot and convert it to a Plotly plot, which can handle interactivity, Helen. So if I run this, it looks the same, but as I hover over, we get all of the information and you can specify that in Plotly. I don't have too much time to go into that today, Helen, but um, the important thing to look at is that you can use ggplotly to actually take plots you've already created in ggplot and make them interactive super quick. And the nice thing about plotly plots is you can zoom in on them so I can look at a particular area of the data and then I can just double click to zoom back out. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, I don't tend to build plotly plots from scratch much because I don't have to create very technical plotly plots. but I tend to, because I really like ggplot, make them in ggplot and then convert them to plotly with two lines. If you get into spatial data, uh, things like tmap and leaflet handle hover over very well. And that's something you'd want with spatial. Um, but again, Sorry. not something we can go into today. Yeah, sure. Uh, quickly, how, how would we save or, or, or distribute uh, one of these interactive plotly chaps? I mean, because I can't ping it. Yep, true. So um, if you try and export a Plotly, it will save it as a web page. Now, a web page is just a HTML file. And the thing people get stressed about with HTML is they say, oh, I don't want my data to go online. Well, actually, a HTML file is just a file. Yes, you might open it with a, with a, a browser, but you don't actually have to make that online. So if I save this as a web page now, I can save it as my underscore Plotly. It's a HTML file. Now. Um, this is this would just be a file on my computer called myplotly.html. I could email it to you and you could open it up on your browser. It doesn't have to live online. So you would export it as a HTML file that allows it to still be interactive and you can still email it to people. A HTML file is just a file, right? Um, so that's the way you would handle that. Does that make sense? Yes, that, no, that, that's great. That's perfect. Thanks. Super. Um, okay, so I went on a detour. Sorry, I do like a bit of Plotly. Um, it works really nicely. And if you're interested in playing around with the interactivity, have a look at that function in more detail. You can specify a label argument, I think, in here, and it will change. I can't remember off the top of my head, but if we do something like maybe label equals actor, I think that will uh, come through here. So hopefully now the label is just, yeah, actor. So. Um, have a play with that. Um, themes, uh, pretty much done talking about themes, to be honest. Um, 
this is the eight built in with ggplot. Um, they're nice, but they're not the most exciting in the world. Um, there's lots of other plots, um, plot styles available. So GG themes um, has got a bunch of ones built in. So if you're missing your Excel, there's a theme Excel that will bring back that, that beautiful gray background that we all um, despise. Um, there's a, a, another theme minimal and a, a theme HC as well. Our favorite at the moment in Jumping Rivers is quite an opinionated theme, um, HRBR themes. Um, they've got some really nice default themes. Um, so that will take something like the bond data and really sort of tidy it up and look quite smart. I think eventually what will happen within the NHS is that a number of key individuals that are really using R actively will probably create an NHS theme at some point, or there'll be different regions, right? So a PHW theme, a PHE theme, a Greater Manchester health and social care theme and um, those will get sort of shared so hopefully um, you won't have to all individually create your own theme from scratch but it is possible to create a theme from scratch and it's not too hard oh Jacqueline says that a colleague has created a theme with their team brand fantastic yeah so then it, the nice thing is Jacqueline that it only takes one person to make that theme and then you can all use it so using a theme is easy creating a theme isn't too hard um, but you know, when you're just starting out, just choose a theme you like. And um, you can even style your plot based on your favorite TV show with the package TV themes. How would you share it, Stuart? Um, lots of different ways. You could just make the code available on a GitHub GIST or just circulate it in-house. You could create an R package and actually um, use that R package to share that theme. And that's the thing that I would recommend um, long term making an R package is not scary um, and you don't need to wait until you've got years and years of code and fantastic functions to write an R package you can write an R package that just has a theme in it and that would be justifiable as people have right the TV themes um, so what I imagine is is that at some point there'll be a collection of themes in an, in an NHS type R package um, which makes them available does that make sense Stuart so NHS, yep, well, you can put, yes, that's true. So you can actually make, um, submit our packages to CRAN as well. It's not too scary, um, but it does take a little bit more time than putting something on GitHub. But yeah, um, I'm sure there will be theme packages on CRAN NHS ones in, in no time. Yep, maybe in the future, yeah. Okay, so um, I think I'm done chatting. Um, let's have a go at some practicals, but also I'm very happy to answer people's questions as well. I think that's more useful. So I will set you off for about 10 minutes on some practicals and then we'll regroup and I'm going to just summarise, uh, give you a kind of recap and send you off with some resources. So we'll have sort of maybe eight minutes or so playing with the practicals and then we'll all come together. I'll recap what we've done and then we can have some, some Q&A. So we'll get on with another practical, which is practical two, which is um, in the Studio cloud, practical two. And all we're getting you to do is have a go at playing with the color size and alpha parameters. And we're gonna get you to, we're also gonna teach you something, I think, was it, um, Roy Dino that asked about stacked bar charts. If you go through the example, we're going to um, show you how that works as well and get you to play with some themes. So let's have eight minutes or so just working on this practicals. I'll try and be quiet and um, when we'll regroup in, in eight minutes or so. Um, don't worry if you haven't finished everything. All of the answers are in the R Markdown document. And um, if you get super stuck, you can hit me up on Twitter and I can explain it again for you. Um, what I will do is I'll talk through one of the questions um, with someone. Um, so let's see who's still around. Um, Emily, are you happy to unmute? We'll just have a chat. Don't worry if you haven't finished everything or we'll work through three things. Are you happy just to have a quick chat with me, Emily? Hello. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Um, yeah, I can do, but I have to confess that I haven't actually just done the practicals because I had some other work. Fine. No, that's fine. That's totally expected. So what we can do is we can have a go. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to create, uh, let me see what we actually say in the practical. Ba -ba -bam. 
what I'm going to do first of all is we'll just have a go at it's taking a basic plot and we'll just have a play around with some of the different arguments. So this is a, a G on point. So I guess tell me something we could change about this 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 plot. So we talked about a lot of different things we could change in the plot. Just tell me something that we could change here. Um, you could change the size of the point. Yeah. So where would we do that and how? Um, yes, if you wanted it to depend on a column, you would put it inside the aesthetic bit. Perfect. Yep. So we could put the um, number of the relationships, that's numeric. We could put that inside here in an AES. So we could say the size of the plot is based on the number of relationships in the data and then we get um, we can see that variable on there fantastic can you tell me one other thing we could change other than the size uh, you could also change the color yep so let's say we want to change the color for all of the points where we would we do that so not changing it to based on the data all, yeah let's to make them all the same color all marine four yep. um so you put it after relationships, but not within that bracket outside. Perfect. It. Yep, exactly. So I, I have to use the colour argument and I could do something like maroon four and that would change them all. Fantastic. The other little thing um, that goes through in the practical, which is more just trying to work things out, is we've got a nice bar chart here of the bonds and the nationalities. So we've got about 14 English nationality actors. Uh, the uh, sorry, the not actors, the films that had English James Bonds, um, number of films that had a Bond played by an Irish person, a Scottish person, and that one film uh, with Lazenby, the Australian. Um, so if we were to try and change the um, the fill of this by the actor, right? So the colour of this bar chart by the actor, how would we do that? Uh, you need to put the aesthetic, the AES inside yeah. there, yeah. Perfect. And then, is it fill or colour? Color? So it's, it's, well, I'll show you actually, if you put colour equals actor, what happens is actually the outline of the bar gets coloured. Okay. So um, in this case, we need to fill. Yeah. Super. And the interesting thing is, this is a stacked bar chart, effectively, we've created. If we want to kind of have them so they're next to each other, we can set an argument here. We can say position equals dodge. And what that will do is it will take it from a stack bar chart into one where they're kind of all lined up. So actually, these relate to just there was effectively one actor. Sean Connery is the only Scottish actor who was in six films. Piers Brosnan for who is Irish. But actually, we've had three English actors playing James Bond. Does that make sense how you can use this argument with a bar chart to change it from kind of stacked to dodge? So I'll put it back to stack. And that just changes that behavior of how the fill works. Does that kind of make sense, Emily? Yeah. Fantastic. Any other questions for me or you're good head full? I wanted to ask if there's a way to, you know how you did the facets before so you can yeah. show multiple plots Mm -hmm. in that plot area yeah is there a way to show different types of charts in the plot area or is that something you have to do like you i don't know how you do, would you have to use like shiny or just do it outside of our studio so you mean like so you can have a bar chart here and a histogram here yeah sort of thing yeah you wouldn't do that in facet because faceting is specifically for splitting um putting multiple of, of, yeah, breaking down by variable but it's very easy to do yeah. however i always 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 remember that forget the package i think it's called patchwork is my favorite way of doing it uh let's do a quick google patchwork ggplot2 composer of plots so what this will allow you to do is basically create lots of different plots and shove them together in different ways so you can see there's an example here you'd have to load in the patchwork library so they've created mm -hmm. one plot called plot one which is a scatter plot and they've saved it yeah. as a variable and then they've created another one and saved it as a variable and literally yeah. just p1 plus 2 p2 when you've got the patchwork library installed will combine them together into one plot for you 
and you can do all sorts of complicated things so here this is the syntax you would use to have three plots on top of one so there's oh, lots cool. of different art yeah. packages for combining plots but my favorite is patchwork um but you'd need to install that package okay. that makes sense yeah that's great thank you super um stuart's got a question um so stuart is asking oh sorry thank you as well emily thank you for, for stepping in there um yeah stuart's got a question mm -hmm. how are they ordered on the x-axis i assume that's related to the bar chart stuart Australian, English, Irish, Scottish. Can anyone spot why they're ordered that way? If you see it, let me know in the chat why they ordered that way. It is alphabetical, yep, um, correct. So the default ordering of categorical variables is alphabetical. So if you do days of the week, um, uh, Wednesday is gonna come before, uh, after Friday. <laughs> Um, so you can't change that in ggplot alone. A lot of the things that you need to change in ggplot, you need to change in your data. The way you would change that is with factors. Again, not something I can go into today. Have a look at the four cats package by um, the Tidyverse people. Four cats is a package all about handling factors in R. So what you would do, Andrew, and it wasn't Andrew, it was Stuart that was asking, is before you plot your data, you would use something like the mutate function to manipulate your data to take that column and actually specify the, the factors and specify that order of the levels. But yeah, something you have to do before the plot, which actually brings me very nicely into my wrap up slides, Stuart. So good work on that, which I've managed to lose as well, which is great. So let me just pop over to bit.ly slash NHS ggplot2. So if you lose this our Studio Cloud, this is all on the Jumping Rivers um, GitHub page. And I'll open my slides. Um, so, yeah, I just want to leave you with some reminders, really, because these, having taught ggplot to beginners a lot, these are the things that people constantly kind of trip up over. So as I think, um, Rory asked straight uh, very early on, ggplot2 is the name of the package, but ggplot is the function name. So um, if you're getting errors trying to type ggplot2 data aesthetic, um, that's why. ggplot2 is the package, ggplot is the function. The aesthetics, I know I've drilled it down into you, <laughs> you're probably fed up of me saying it. Uh, if it's related to the data, it's Goes out, uh, it goes inside the AES. If it's not related to the data, it goes outside. So color all points blue, outside the aesthetic. Color points based on the gender, inside the aesthetic. Round brackets, yeah, people always forget the type geom points, don't put the open close round brackets at the end. Geom, geoms, geometries are functions. So you, they need to have the open and close round brackets even if you're not passing any arguments. The plus symbol um, at the end to join your layers is really important as well. So that's one to remember. Um, are you plotting something sensible? So this is questions like, um, are you trying to change the shape parameter based on a continuous variable, right? Um, so if you've got a number that goes from one to a thousand, you can't specify um, the, the shape based on that number because there aren't a thousand shapes to choose from so are you actually is what you're trying to do actually sensible and then i guess kind of related to stuart's question try manipulating your data before plotting it so normally in most cases like why is my data you know why is it showing me different numbers on the bar or why um why am i my days of the week in the wrong order, they're in alphabetical. Normally, it's not something you want to fix in ggplot. It's something you need to fix outside ggplot before plotting it. And this is a really big one. Um, so I think if you can manipulate your data before you plot it. And um, just going back to the bar charts we looked at at the start, if you just want to specify your x-axis and you want to have y, um, ggplot do the counting for you, then you use the geom bar function, the geom bar geometry. However, if you've already summarized your data and you, you know what you want on the y-axis, use the geomcol function um, and that will allow you to specify both x and y. So those are my sort of top troubleshooting tips. Um, these, are the, these are the things that people trip up on, but I think you've all done a really good job today and seem to be managing fantastic. So 
places to learn more about ggplot the alpha data science book chapter three is all about ggplot it's really really good there's also the r graphics cookbook these are all links as well so in your slides you'll be able to click on these that's a very nice resource. Um, the R Studio ggplot2 cheat sheet. Uh, I've got a whole book of them. In fact, I can't quite reach now. Let's see. No. Ah, there we go. I've got, oh, I'm just spilling my books everywhere. Um, I've got a whole book of printed out cheat sheets because even though I've been using R for 12 years now, I still have to look up how do I use the fill scale function? How do I create this sort of plot in ggplot? So don't be scared to print out a cheat sheet, put it, put it proud on your desk. It's, um, it's nice to have the reminder. Um, Tidy Tuesday, if you've not heard of Tidy Tuesday, it's um, a, a, an event that happens every week on Twitter where um, the R for Data Science learning community posts a data set and then everyone has a go at creating a plot based on that data set. And some people have just learned ggplot and they're making, you know, the most basic scatter plot in the world. And that's great. Some people have been using ggplot for years and create some really magical plots. So I'd highly recommend you have a go at it to practice your ggplot skills. So have a go at taking part in a hashtag tidy Tuesday challenge. Um, or just have a look at the hashtag on Twitter and you'll see there's, you know, um, a lot of different um, fantastic um, plots being made and it'll give you inspiration about the sorts of plots that you can make and the huge variety of plots you can make. Uh, and if you want to know more as well, we do offer um, training courses. So if you want some more formal training like this, um, do get in contact with me and I can arrange that. And finally, I would love to see any cool plots you make, either you've made today in the practical or um, that you make having a go tomorrow or next week. So if you do make any cool plots, do tweet at the NHSR Conf 2020 and tag me in it so I can see. And I can see that Sharon's also put a link to um, a survey for you to fill in, I assume, for the NHS conference. So if you can fill that in as well, that's really useful for the NHS conference organisers so they know if it's um, the sort of workshop that's useful to you. So um, we've got a couple of minutes, so I'm going to stick around and answer Q&As. But um, otherwise, I've had a really lovely afternoon with you all and um, I hope you enjoy the conference next week. It looks like it's going to be fantastic. Um, so yeah, thanks for your time. Um, I'll stick around to answer some Q and A's. Um, but otherwise, yeah, lovely chatting with you all, and uh, hopefully see you in person at the conference in a, in another year. Thank you. Thanks. But yeah, if anyone's got any Q and A's, uh, anything they want to ask about ggplot, uh, I'll be sticking around. But if you want to get off, that's fine too. No questions from me. I just wanted to say a massive thank you. That was really, really good. Really interesting. Thanks a lot. Cheers, Paul. Thanks for your contributions. Nice see you chat. later. Yeah, see you later. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Mung and Zahid and Helen and Stuart and Emily. Yeah, Sally, AES, you can lose hours, can't you? Uh, sorry to drill it in, but it's so important. I uh, hope, hope you've got it, got it down now. No, I, I, it has never been... Um made explicit and I've sat there and gone through Google searches and you just get wrapped in knots about when to use it and when not and your charts don't look like you expect them to do um, mm. and it, it, I've just never known so I think that's the massive takeaway and I will be sharing it with everyone <laughs> fantastic yeah and it's not worth getting yourself stressed about it's so hard isn't it when you yeah. google and you're going why and it's so frustrating when it's not what it looks like and it's not actually that hard is it so well it, it's just you know you you just explained it really well and it's like oh that that's obvious um Super, but, thanks you know and when you're not when you're not surrounded by other people who working in R, then you just you know you might as well just turn to the wall beside you and get off it um so yeah that, that's um i say the massive takeaway um super so, yeah thank you and the rest has, has been just nice to have that to consolidate the other super. bits of learning around it so thank you very much no worries thank you sally thanks joho if you've got any questions i know you missed a bit do feel free to hit me on twitter if you get stuck looking at anything in the next week or so Uh, we've still got Stuart and Jacqueline. Have you got any questions at all you need a hand with? Uh, 
No, Rihanna, I was just trying to do the survey and there wasn't less than me. said oh. the one from this morning for Arthur XL. Uh, you should let Sharon know. Oh, Sh yeah, Sharon's still here. Yeah. Um, here. Okay, yeah. Um, Stuart was just saying he's having a bit of trouble doing the survey because he sat in a workshop this morning. Oh, really? Okay. I'll have a look at that for you then, Stuart. Okay. Thank you. Are Thanks, you Stuart. Sorry, Stuart. Are you attending any other workshops this week? Well, I did one this morning. I'm doing I'm doing one tomorrow as well and then on Friday, I think. Okay, that's fine because it's the same link um, to the survey. Ah. So when you go in, you have to choose what workshop you attended. So of course, you, right. You have to do it three or four times. So hopefully by tomorrow, we'll get it sorted for you. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank okay, you. Cool. Thank you. Sounds like you've got a busy week, Stuart. Well, but I've got to use text, so I'm, I'm doing this and trying to keep away from work emails. Yep, that's just 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 delete them all. <laughs> that's what I do. Yeah, <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah, I might try I'm that. Joking. 